Hegel's phenomenology of spirit, consciousness, force and understanding, appearance and the supersensible world. In the dialectic of sensitivity, sense and hearing have been lost to consciousness, and as perception, consciousness has arrived at thoughts, which it brings together for the first time in the unconditioned universal. This now, if it were taken as an inert simple essence, would itself in turn be nothing else than the one-sided extreme of being for self. For it would then be confronted by non-essence. But if it were related to this, it would itself be unessential, and consciousness would not have escaped from the deception of the perceptual process. However, this universal has proved to be one which has returned into itself, out of such a conditioned being for self. This unconditioned universal, which is now the true object of consciousness, is still just an object for it. Consciousness has not yet grasped the notion of the unconditioned as notion. It is essential to distinguish the two, for consciousness, the object has returned into itself from its relation to another and has thus become notion in principle. Uh, but consciousness is not yet for itself the notion and consequently does not recognize itself in that reflected object. For us, this object has developed through the movement of consciousness in such a way that consciousness is involved in that development and the reflection is the same on both sides. Of these there is only one reflection, but since in this movement consciousness has for its content merely the objective essence and non-consciousness as such, uh, the result must have an objective significance for consciousness. Consciousness still shrinks away from what has emerged and takes it as the essence in the objective sense. With this, the understanding has indeed superseded its own untruth and the untruth of the object. What has emerged for it as a result is the notion of the true, but only as the implicit being of the true, which is not yet notion, or which lacks the being for self of consciousness, and which the understanding, without knowing itself therein, lets go its own way. This truth follows out its own essence, so that consciousness plays no part in its free realization, but merely looks on and simply apprehends it. To begin with, therefore, we must step into its place and be the notion which develops and fills out what is contained in the result. It is through awareness of this completely developed object, which presents itself to consciousness as something that immediately is, that consciousness first becomes explicitly a consciousness that comprehends its object. The result was the unconditioned universal, initially in the negative and abstract sense, that consciousness negated its one-sided notions and abstracted them, in other words, it gave them up. But the result has implicitly a positive significance in it. Uh, the unity of being for self and being for another is posited. In other words, the absolute antithesis is posited as a self identical essence. At first sight, this seems to concern only the form of the moment in reciprocal relation, but being for self and being for another are the content itself as well, uh, since the antithesis in its truth can have no other nature than the one yielded in the result. Viz, that the content taken in perception to be true belongs in fact only to the form in the unity of which it is dissolved. The content is likewise universal. There can be no other content which by its particular constitution would fail to fall within this unconditioned universality. A content of this kind would be some particular way or other of being for itself and of being in relation to another. But in general, to be for itself and to be in relation to another constitutes the nature and essence of the content whose truth consists in its being unconditionally universal and the result is simply and solely universal. But because the unconditioned universal is an object for consciousness, there emerges in the distinction of form and content, and in the shape of content, the moments look like they did when they first presented themselves on one side, a universal medium of many subsistent matters, and on the other side, a one reflected into itself, in which their independence is extinguished. The former is the dissolution of the thing's independence, that is, the passivity that is a being for another, the latter is a being for self. We have to see how these moments exhibit themselves in the unconditioned universe. 
which is their essence. It is clear that at the outset that since they exist only in this universality, they are no longer separated from one another at all, but are in themselves essentially self-superseding aspects, and what is posited is only their transition into one another. One moment, then, appears as the essence that has stepped to one side as a universal medium or as the subsistence of independent matters. But the independence of these matters is nothing else than this medium. In other words, the unconditioned universal is simply and solely the plurality of the diverse universals of this kind. That within itself the universal is in individual, is undivided unity, with this plurality, means, however, that these matters are each where the other is. They mutually inter interpenetrate, but without coming into contact with one another, because, conversely, the many diverse matters are equally independent. This also means that they are absolutely porous, or are sublated. The sublated, in its turn, the reduction of the diversity to a pure being for self, is nothing other than the medium itself, and this is the independence of the different matters. In other words, the matters posited as independent uh, directly pass over into their unity, and their unity directly unfolds its diversity. And this once again uh, reduces itself to unity, but this movement is what is called force. One of its moments, the dispersal of the independent matters in their immediate being, is the expression of force, but force taken as that in which they uh, have just disappeared, is force proper. A force which has been driven back into itself from its expression. First, however, the force which is driven back into itself must express itself, and secondly, is still force remaining within itself in the expression. Uh, just as much as it is expression in this self containedness When we thus preserve the two moments in their immediate unity, the understanding to which the notion of force belongs, is, strictly speaking, the notion which sustains the different moments qua different, for in themselves they are not supposed to be different. Consequently, the difference exists only in thought. That is to say, what has been posited in the foregoing is, in the first instance, only the notion of force, not its reality. In point of fact, however, force in the unconditioned universal, which is equally in its own self, what it is for another, or which contains the difference in its own self, for difference is nothing else than being for another, in order then that force may in truth be, it must be completely set free from thought, it must be posited as the substance of these differences, that is, first the substance as the whole force, remaining essentially in and for itself, and then its difference as possessing substantial being or as moments existing on their own account, force as such or as driven back into itself, thus exists on its own account as an exclusive one, uh, for which the unfolding of the different matters is another subsisting essence. But thus two distinct independent aspects are set up, but force is also the whole, that is, it remains what is according to its notion, that is to say, these differences remain pure forms superficial vanishing moments. At the same time, there would be no difference at all between force proper, which has driven back into itself, and force unfolded into independent matters. If they had no enduring being, or there would be no force if it did not exist in these opposite ways. But that it does exist in these opposite ways simply means uh, that the two moments are at the same time themselves independent. It is therefore this movement of the two moments in which they are perpetually give themselves independence and then supersede themselves again which we are now to consider. In general it is clear that the this uh, movement is nothing else than the movement of perceiving in which the two sides, the percipient and what is perceived, are indistinguishably one and the one in the apprehension of the true and yet each side is at the same time equally reflected into itself, or has a being of its own. Here these two sides are moments of force. Uh, they are just as much in a unity as this unity which appears 
as the middle term over against the independent extremes is a perpetual diremption of itself into just these extremes which exist only through this process. Thus, the movement, uh, which previously displayed itself as the self-destruction of contradictory notions, here has objective form and is the movement of force, the outcome of which is the unconditioned universal as something not objective or as the inner being of things. Force as the determined, since it is conceived as force, or as reflected into itself, is one side of its notion, but posited as a substantial extreme and moreover with the express character of a one. Uh, the subsistence of the unfolded matters outside of force is thus preclude, precluded and is something other than force, since it is necessary that force itself be the subsistence, or that express itself, its expression presents itself in this wise, uh, that the said other approaches it and solicits it. But, as a matter of fact, uh, since its expression is necessary, what is posited as another essence is in force itself. We must retract the assertion that force is posited as a one, and that its essence is to express itself as another which approaches it externally. Force is rather itself this universal medium in which the moments subsist as matters, or, in other words, force has expressed itself and what was supposed to be something else soliciting, it is really force itself. It exists therefore now as the medium of the unfolded matters, uh, but equally essentially it has the form of the possession of the subsisting matters, or is essentially a one. Consequently, uh, this oneness, since force is positive as the medium of the matters, is now something other than force, uh, which has this its essence outside of it, but since force must of necessity be this oneness, which it is not as yet posited as being, uh, this other approaches it, soliciting it to reflect itself into itself. In other words, force supersedes its expression, but in fact, force is itself this reflect reflectedness into itself, or the this supersession of the expression. The oneness in the form in which it appeared, viz. as an other, vanishes. Force is this other itself, is force that is driven back into itself. What appears as another and solicits force, both through expression and to a return in, in, to itself, directly proves to be itself force, for the other shows itself to be as much a universal medium as a one, and in such a way that each of these forms at the same time appears only as a vanishing moment. Consequently, force, in that there is another for it, and it is for another, has not yet altogether emerged from its notion. There are, at the same time, two forces present. The notion of both is no doubt the same, but it has gone forth from its unity into a duality. Instead of the antithesis remaining entirely and essentially only a moment, it seems by its self-direction into, into two wholly independent forces to have drawn, withdrawn from the controlling unity. We have now to see more closely the implications of this independence in the first place, uh, the second force appears as the one that solicits, and moreover, in accordance with its content, as the universal medium in relation to the force characterised as the one solicited. Uh, but since the second force is essentially an alter alternation of these two moments, and is itself force, it is likewise the universal medium only through its being solicited to be such, and similarly too, it is a negative unity. That is, it solicits the retraction of force into itself only through its being uh, solicited to do so. Consequently, the distinction uh, to which had obtained between the two forces, one of which was supposed to be the soliciting and the other the solicited, force is transformed into the same reciprocal interchange of the determinedness. The interplay of the two forces thus consists in their being determined as mutually opposed, in their being for one another in this determination and in the absolute immediate alternation of the determinedness, determin determinations consists, that is, in the transition through which alone these determinations are in which they force seem to make an independent appearance. Uh, the soliciting force, for example, is posited as a universal medium, and the one solicited, on the other hand, as force driven back into itself. But the former is a universal medium only through the other being force, that is driven back into itself, or it is really the latter that is the soliciting force 
for the other and is what makes it a medium. The first force has its determinateness only through the other and solicits only insofar as the other solicits it to be a soliciting force and just as directly it loses the determinateness given to it for this passes over or rather has already passed over to the other. The external soliciting force appears as a universal medium but only through its having been solicited by the other force to do so. But this means that the latter gives it that character and is really itself essentially a universal medium. It gives the soliciting force this character just because this other determination is essential to it. That is, because this is really its own self. To complete our insight into the notion of this movement, it may further be noticed that the difference themselves, the differences themselves, are exhibited in a twofold difference, one as a difference of content, one extreme being the force reflected into itself, but the other the medium of the matters, and again as a difference of form, since one solicits and the other is solicited, the former being active and the other passive. According to the difference of content, they are distinguished merely in principle or for us, but according to the difference of form, they are independent and in their relation keep themselves separate and opposed to one another. The fact that the extremes from which the standpoint of both these sides are thus nothing in themselves, that these sides in which their different, different essences were supposed to consist are only vanishing moments, are an immediate transition of each into its opposite. This truth becomes apparent to consciousness in its perception of the movement of force, but for us, as remarked above, something more was apparent, viz. that the differences, qua differences, of content and form, uh, vanish in themselves on the side of form, and the essence of the active, uh, soliciting or independent side was the same as that which on the side of content presented itself as force uh, driven back into itself. The side which was passive, which was solicited or for another, was uh, from the side of form. Uh, the same as that which from the side of content presented itself as the universal medium of the many matters. From this we see that the notion of force becomes actual uh, through its duplication into two forces, and how it comes to be so. These two forces exist as independent essences, but their existence is a movement of each towards the other, such that their being is rather a pure positiveness, or a being that is posited by another. That is, their being has really the significance of a sheer vanishing. They do not exist as extremes which retain for themselves something fixed and substantial, uh, transmitting to one another in their middle term, and in their contact a merely external property. On the contrary, what they are, they are only in, the, in this middle term and in this contact. In this there is immediately present both the repression within itself of force or its being for self as well as its expression, a force that solicits and force that is solicited. Consequently, uh, these moments are not divided into two independent extremes, offering each other only a, an opposite extreme. Their essence rather consists simply and solely in this, that each is solely through the other, and what each this thus is, it immediately no longer is, since it is the other. They have thus in fact no substances of their own which might support and maintain them. The notion of force rather preserves itself as the essence in its very actuality. Force as actual exists simply and solely in its expression, which at the same time is nothing else than a supersession of itself. The actual force, when thought of as free from its expression and as being for itself, is force driven back into itself, but in fact this determinateness, as we have found, is itself only a moment of force, force's expression. Uh, thus the truth of force remains only the thought of it, the moments of its actuality, their substances, and their movement, collapse unresistingly 
into an undifferentiated unity, a unity which is not forced driven back into the itself, into itself, for this itself is itself only such a moment, but is its nature qua nature, it is its notion qua notion. Then, thus, the realization of force is at the same time the loss of reality. In that realization, it has really become not something quite different, is this universality which the understanding knows at the outset or immediately to be its essence and which also proves itself to be such in the supposed reality of force in the actual uh, substances. In so far as regard the first universal as the understanding's notion in which force is not yet for itself, the second now is force's essence as it exhibits itself in and for itself, or conversely, if we regard the first universal as the immediate, which was supposed to be an actual object for consciousness, then the second is determined as the negative of force that is objective to sense. It is force in the form of its true essence, in which it exists only as an object for the understanding the first universal would be force uh, driven back into itself, or force as substance. The second, however, is the inner being of things qua inner, which is the same as the notion of force qua notion. The true essence of things has now the character of not being immediate, immediately for consciousness. On the contrary, consciousness has a immediate, mediated relation to the inner being, and as the understanding looks through the mediating play of forces into the true background of things, the middle term which unites the two extremes, the understanding and the inner world, is the developed being of force, which for the understanding itself is henceforth only a vanishing. This being is therefore called appearance, for we call being that is directly and in its own self a non-being a surface show. But it is not merely a surface show, it is appearance, a totality of show. And this totality, as totality or as a universal, is what constitutes the inner of things, the play of force as a reflection of the inner into itself. In it, the things of perception are expressly present for consciousness as they are in themselves, is as moments which immediately and without rest or stay, turn into their opposite. The one immediately into the universal, the essential immediately into the unessential, and vice versa. This play of forces is consequently the developed negative, but its truth is the positive, viz. the universal, the object that in itself possesses being. The being of this object for consciousness is mediated by the movement of appearance, in which the being of perception and the centrally objective in general has a mere, merely negative significance. Consciousness therefore reflects itself out of uh, this movement back into itself as the true, but qua consciousness converts this truth again into an objective inner and distinguishes the reflection of things from its own reflection into itself just as the movement of mediation is likewise still objective for it. The inner is therefore for consciousness an extreme of against it, but it is for consciousness the true, since in the inner as the in itself it possesses at the same time the certainty of itself or the moment of its being for self. But it, it is not yet conscious of this ground or basis, for the being for self which the inner was supposed to possess in its own self, would be nothing else but a negative movement. This, however, is for consciousness still the objective vanishing appearance, not yet its own being for self. Consequently, the inner is for its certainly notion, but it does not as yet know the nature of the notion. Within this inner truth, as the absolute universal, which has been purged of the antithesis between the universal and the individual, and has become the object of the understanding, there now opens up above the sensuous world, 
which is the world of appearance, a supersensible world, which henceforth is the true world. Above the vanishing present world, there opens up a permanent beyond, as an inner self, which is the first and therefore imperfect appearance of reason, or only the pure element in which the truth has its essence. Our object is thus from now on the syllogism which has for its extremes the inner being of things and the understanding and for its middle term appearance. But the movement of this syllogism yields the further determination of what the understanding describes in this inner world through the middle term and the experience from which understanding learns about the close linked unity of these terms. The inner world is for consciousness still a pure beyond because consciousness does not as yet find itself in it. It is empty for it is merely the nothingness of appearance and positively the simple or unitary universal. This mode of the inner being of things finds ready acceptance by those who say that the inner being of things is unknowable but another reason for this would have to be given. Certainly, we have no knowledge of this inner world as it is here in its immediacy, but not because reason is too short-sighted or is limited, or however else one likes to call it. On this point we know nothing as yet because we have not yet gone deep enough, but because of the simple nature of the matter in hand, that is to say, because in the void nothing is known or expressed from the other side just because this inner world is determined as the beyond of consciousness. Uh, the result is of course the same if a blind man is placed amid the wealth of the supersensible world, if it has such wealth, whether it be its own peculiar content or whether consciousness itself be this content, and if what with and if one with sight is placed in pure darkness or if you like in pure light, just supposing the supersensible world to be this. The man with sight sees as little in that pure light as in pure darkness, and just as much as the blind man in the abundant wealth which lies before him. If no further significance attached to the inner world, and to our close link with it through the world of appearance, uh, then nothing would be left to us but to stop at the world of appearance, that is, to perceive something as true which we know is not true or in order that there may yet be something in the void which though it first came about though it first came about as a devoid of objective things must however as empty in itself be taken as also void of all spiritual relationships and distinctions of consciousness qua consciousness in order then that this in this complete void which is even called the holy of holies there may yet be something we must fill it up with reveries, appearances, produced by consciousness itself. It would have to be content with being treated so badly, for it would not deserve anything better, uh, since even reveries are better uh, than its own emptiness. The inner world, or supersensible beyond, has, however, come into being. It comes from the world of appearance, which has mediated it. In other words, appearance is its essence, and in fact its filling. Uh, the supersensible is the sensuous, and the perceived posited, as it is in truth, but the truth of the sensuous and the perceived is to be appearance. The supersensible, therefore, is therefore appearance qua appearance. We completely misunderstand this if we think that the supersensible world is therefore the sensuous world, or the world as it exists, for immediate sense certainty and perception. For the world of appearance is, on the contrary, not the world of uh, sense knowledge and perception as a world that positively is, uh, but this world posited as a superseded, or as in truth an inner world. It is often said that the supersensible world is not appearance, but what is here understood by appearance 
is not appearance but rather the sensuous world as itself the really actual. The understanding, which is our object, finds itself in just this position that the inner world has come into being for it to begin with only as the universal still unfilled in itself. The play of forces has merely this negative significance of being in itself nothing, and is only positive significance that of being the mediating agency, but outside of the understanding. The connection of the understanding with the inner world uh, through the mediation is, however, its own movement through which the inner world will fill itself out for the understanding. What is immediate for the understanding is the play of forces, but what is true for it is the simple inner world. The movement of force is therefore the true, likewise only as something altogether simple. We have seen, however, that this play of forces is so constituted that the force which is solicited by another force is equally the soliciting force for that other, which only thereby becomes itself a soliciting force. What is present in this interplay is likewise merely the immediate alternation, or the absolute interchange, of the determinateness which constitutes the sole content of what appears to be either a universal medium or a negative unity. It ceases immediately on its appearance, in determinate form, to be what it was on appearing, by appearing in determinate form. It solicits in the other side to express itself, that is, the latter is now immediately what the first was supposed to be. Each of these two sides, the relation of soliciting and the relation of the opposed determinant content, is on its own account an absolute reversal and interchange of the determinedness. But these two relations themselves are again one and the same, and the difference of form of being the solicited and the soliciting force is the same as the difference of content of being the solicited force as such, with the passive medium on the one hand and the soliciting force, the active negative unity on, or the one on the other. In this way there vanishes completely all distinction of separate mutually contrasted forces which were supposed to be present in this movement, for they rested solely on those distinctions, and the distinctions between the forces along with both those distinctions likewise collapse collapses into only one. Thus there is neither force, nor the act of soliciting or being solicited, nor the determinateness of being a stable medium, and a unity reflected into itself. There is neither something existing singly by itself, nor are there diverse antitheses. On the contrary, what there is in this absolute philox is only difference as a universal difference, or as a difference into which the many antitheses have been resolved. Uh, the differences, as a, univer as a universal differences, as a universal difference, is consequently the simple element in the player force itself, and what is true in it. It is the law of force. The absolute flux of appearance becomes a simple difference through its relation to the simplicity of the inner world or of the understanding. The inner being is to begin with only implicitly the universal, but this implicit, a simple universal is essentially no less absolutely universal difference, for it is the outcome of the flux itself, or the flux is its essence, but it is a flux that is posited in the inner world as it is in truth, and consequently it is received in that inner world as equally an absolute universal difference that is absolutely at rest and remains self-same. In other words, negation is an essential moment of the universal, and negation or mediation in the universal is therefore a universal difference. Uh, the difference is expressed in the law, which is the stable image of unstable appearance. Consequently, the supersensible world is an inert realm of laws, which though beyond the perceived world, for this exhibits law, only through incessant change, 
is equally present in it and is its direct tranquil image. This realm of laws is indeed the truth for the understanding, and that truth has its content in the law. At the same time, however, this realm is only the initial truth for the understanding and does not fill out the world of appearance. In this the law is present, but is not the entire presence of appearance. With every change of circumstance the law has a different actuality. Thus appearance retains for itself an aspect which is not in the inner world, that is, appearance is not yet truly posited as appearance, as a superseded being for self. This defect in the law must equally be made manifest in the law itself. What seems to be defective in it is that while it does contain differences, the difference is universal, indeterminate. However, insofar as it is not law in general, but a law, it does contain determinateness. Consequently, there are indefinitely many laws, but this plurality is itself rather a defect, for it contradicts the principle of the understanding, for which, as consciousness of the simple inner world, the true is the implicitly universal unity. It must therefore let the many laws collapse into one law, just as, for example, the law by which the stone falls, by which a stone falls, and the law by which the heavenly bodies move, have been grasped as one law. But when the laws thus coincide, they lose their specific character, the law becomes more and more superficial, and as a result, what is found is in fact not the unity of these specific laws, but a law which leaves out their specific character, just as the one law which combines in itself the laws of falling terrestrial bodies and of the motions of the heavenly bodies, in fact, expresses neither law. The unification of all laws in universal attraction expresses no other content than just the mere notion of law itself, which is posited in that law in the form of being. Universal attraction merely asserts that everything has a constant difference in relation to other things. The understanding imagines that in this unification it has found a universal law which expresses universal reality as such, but in fact it has only found uh, the notion of law itself. Although in such a way that what it is saying is that all reality is in its own self, conformable to law. The expression universal attraction is of great importance insofar as it is directed against the thoughtless way in which everything is pictured as contingent and for which determinateness has the form of sensuous independence.